Welcome back, everyone, to the Smooth Brain Society. Today, um, our topic of discussion is going to be Parkinson's disease, but also we're going to be talking about um, potential career in science communications. For that, I have Bethany Fraser. Oh, wait, I should have asked you. Is is Fraser the correct spelling or oh, pronunciation? Fraser, spot on. Yeah, Bethany okay, Fraser. Okay, cool, cool, yeah, cool. You got it right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, got Bethany Fraser on, who I did... Uh, I did master's with in King's College London. Now she's doing a PhD at the University of Liverpool and is also a science communicator herself. She does way cooler stuff because she does public presentations, unlike me who hides behind a mic and pre-recorded settings. But she's on to talk about her work and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about her work in science communication later. So welcome on Beth. Thank you for having me sit here. And as you guys know the concept of the podcast, just for anybody who's new, we get a co-host on who has no idea about the topic. Today, I'll let her introduce herself. We've got Pollyanna on, um, who is a marketing person and has worked in the science, com- not, not science communication, communications and podcast space for a while. So she's probably critiquing how I run this podcast at the moment, but <laughs> welcome on. Thank you for having me, Sahir. Definitely not critiquing. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Pollyanna Ward. Um, and yeah, as Sahir said, I've worked in marketing for the last 10 years. So I'm hoping that I can sort of be a bit of a naive voice uh, in the room for this episode. And hopefully it will come away knowing exactly what Beth actually does. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> All right. So... I guess before we start with what Beth actually does, we should start off how you got here. So could you give us a little background, Beth, into, yeah, why why do a PhD, why get into the work you're doing, and yeah, take it away. Yeah, of course. So, I mean, it's going to be a bit boring to say I just loved the brain when I was about 16, 17. It was just cool. We didn't know what was going on. So I thought, ah, you know, I'm not quite sure what I want to do, classic 17-year-old. So I went to university to do neuroscience with um, psychology. Uh, and it was very, it went to Keele University, lovely little university that gave me loads of opportunities to study abroad. And they also gave me uh, an opportunity to study in, um, or to be a research assistant in Poland for a year, where I was able to actually, I was incredibly lucky, I uh, was able to work with uh, mice looking at... Um, so my cat's going to be in and out. So this is Moose. Um, <laughs> uh, looking at uh, mice and, uh, and schizophrenia, looking at uh, something called MMP9. Don't need to go into details about what it is, but they thought that it might cause some of the uh, symptoms such as uh, hyper, um, lots of movement and um, specific fear responses. Uh, but it's very interesting. Got to work with animals. Uh I don't think I, I think after doing that, I, was like, I don't know if I want to work with animals again. It's quite an intense, um, so when you're studying it, but it was a very cool year. Uh, after that, finished, came back, finished my university degree. Uh, I was one of these people who kind of had classic imposter syndrome. So I uh, <laughs> decided to take two or three years out uh, and I worked as um, a wedding supervisor, which I'm actually so happy I did because my organization skills are now absolutely second to none. Uh, I could plan an event like no tomorrow, <laughs> so it's very enjoyable. But uh, I, I miss neuroscience so much that I went back to uh, and went back to university to do my masters at King's College London in clinical neuroscience. Um, I'd, I, I'd been out for two or three years, so I was quite fearful I wasn't going to be able to get back into it. But I honestly think it was the best year of my life uh, living in London learning all about you know the clinical aspects of neuroscience which I really enjoyed and then I started getting into neuroimaging a little bit more and working with a group who specialized in movement disorders and when I say movement disorders it means that they have problems with their movement uh, but specifically Parkinson's disease which is the second most common neurodegenerative disease uh, second to Alzheimer's disease and I was learning a little bit more about uh, computational skills and about how we can look at the brain using MRI scanners which I could talk a little bit more about later and how it's a non-invasive very cool way for us to take snapshots of the brain I was just absolutely sold um, so then I was a, little, was a research assistant after that for a little while kind of gaining a little bit of experience trying to find the PhD 
and then I met my very lovely um, lab and supervisor, Professor Simon Keller at Liverpool, who uh, I actually applied for a slightly different PhD in um, it was in infectious diseases and uh, uh, and neuroimaging, uh, something called neurosister psychosis, which is basically little worms in your brain, um, mm. which was uh, wild. Uh, my friend Corey's working on that, but after speaking to him, uh, he decided well, he well was like Beth. I can tell how much you really enjoy Parkinson's disease. It's I can see the passion there. I can see the love. And he put in an application and uh, when he awarded it, he gave it to me. And that's how I got here today. Awesome. Fantastic. I think I had just a couple of questions. One is, what is the difference between clinical neuroscience and neuroscience first? <laughs> yep. No, no, no. That's great. So clinical is definitely more, that's a slightly human focused um, and a little bit more in the clinics. When you kind of do pure neuroscience, it can still be clinical, but it might be more cellular or molecular uh, and a little bit maybe further removed from that. So you're kind of looking right down to the cells and the molecules um, or, you know, usually, usually not always, it can be a little bit more wet lab. And when I say wet lab, it means you're doing experimentations with pipettes and you're the usual scientists you see in the lab coats, you know, working away in the lab. Um, but <laughs> uh, but you can still, it, it's basically kind of close, just a little bit more ap- applicable to humans closer i don't know see so here if you have anything more to say about that that's an accurate description yeah that's that's about right i am um, what do you say because i i'm the non-clinical neuroscientist and i so i i work with rats i work with those little cells and pipettes and moving liquids from little tubes just little low tubes and like a real scientist sure Ooh, I, I feel i feel that clinical hurt. neuroscientists get paid more so I don't know. I, uh, I, th- I, th- I think there's a lot more. Uh, no, actually, I don't think it's correct to say like a lot more clinicians do clinical neuroscience because it's a lot more people focused. But that's probably as fair, yeah. So I think naturally they've probably got about five or six years on us, so they they probably <laughs> demand a higher wage. I can mm-hmm. just sneak in there and pretend that I'm part of that gang. <laughs> and I imagine that working on humans are a lot less wriggly than working on animals. Well, it depends. Um, oh, it <laughs> really depends. <laughs> I, I, they definitely complain a little bit more. Uh, no, I joke. Um, it's actually, <laughs> I, 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 I guess that you can get consent from a human, which I uh, quite enjoy. <laughs> uh, no, I've, I've worked with humans as well. And yeah, it's, it's a lot harder to work with humans, I'd say. They talk back. It's a big problem. Yeah. They don't follow rules. Oh my god, rule following is so terrible. In, yeah, in human That's participants. A, yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm part of my study. I'm doing some cognitive tests as well, so it's you know running through, making sure they fill out the uh, the forms accurately. But also, it lands on me a little bit as well because if I don't explain it very well, then other people will struggle. And because I've done it so many times, it's having to each time come back and be like, okay, what was this like the first time you saw it? Um, to kind of try to regularly practice on people to make sure I'm still explaining it well enough. Okay, because you said you want you were going to explain a little bit about Parkinson's. Let's mm-hmm. let's go with that. Um, so, yeah. could you tell us a bit more about Parkinson's apart from it just being the second most common neurodegenerative disease? Yeah, of course. So, uh, as Pollyanna said, it affects part of the brain called the basal ganglia. I won't go into the tens of sections within the basal ganglia but i'll give you one area within the basal ganglia called the substantia nigra that it affects and it affects these dopamine producing neurons now dopamine is a neurotransmitter and a neurotransmitter is basically how the brain talks to each other and in this case with with those loss of dopamine cells it causes a loss of movement Uh, in the long run and because it's degenerative that means that it gets worse and worse and worse over time so your movement will get continue to get worse and worse with this build-up with this loss of neurons um and this build-up of something called alpha synuclein uh and what's alpha synuclein it's basically these little protein aggregates when i say an aggregate aggregate basically it's just a mass that is insoluble. It doesn't go away. It attaches to the cells and it doesn't leave and it causes problems because specifically for this substantia nigra area that I said, 
it causes this loss of dopamine cells, but it spreads throughout the brain. But this area, substantia nigra or basal ganglia, is particularly susceptible to the alpha synuclein. So that's maybe the, the biology behind it. Um, do you have any questions about the biology, Pollyanna? I could move on to the clinical uh, or the, how it presents a little bit more. My question is, is there anyone famous that has Parkinson's disease? Yes, yes. Um, yes there's, I think it is relatively common. Um, and you've got Michael J. Fox, who had quite, he was very young. He was 29 when he was diagnosed. So it's quite uh, relatively rare to get it that young. Usually it affects people over the age of 55. So Ozzy Osbourne uh, has it as well at the moment. Um, yeah, he does. Yeah, so there's um, I know that. yeah. Uh, um, so yeah, it affects everyone. I'm pretty sure Muhammad Ali had it, right? That's what he had. Yeah, absolutely, Muhammad yeah. Ali. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was yes. that was really interesting because I can talk onto that a little bit more. But uh, there was questions um, if Muhammad Ali had it because uh, it seems to be an increased amount of boxers and fighters uh, seem to have uh, Parkinson's disease and are wondering if it's some insults to or brain injury that causes the Parkinson's disease. I think Michael Parkinson of the TV show from years ago was also diagnosed that now you've prompted a thought. Yeah. Thought. Yeah. But no, it wasn't. Mm. A, I think I maybe did see that Ozzy Osbourne had it, which is, mm. I mean, you mentioned there that Michael J. Fox was super young, 29. When, yeah. when might you start seeing it? like more gen like what is the average average um or probably it gets more common as you get older so you will see it the older the people are the more likely they are to have it i believe um people over the age of 65 one in 100 people will have parkinson's disease i believe it goes to fa- um five in every hundred or one in every 20 by the time you reach 80 or 85 so it continuously increases um, yeah, with some scary figures, uh, for example, um, they're expecting in the next 30 years that one in 37 people will will be diagnosed with Parkinson's disease as we've got an aging population. Yeah, it's, it's a high figure. So pe- I'll put it this way. People who are alive today, there is a one in 37 chance that they will get Parkinson's disease. Um, so it's it's coming in hot and fast. Uh, so it's important why we research it. <laughs> So is that purely because of just the population aging or is that also for other environmental reasons? Just the population aging. Yeah. So it's because we've got an aging population. It's nothing to be, that sounds scary. It's, be, it's, 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 it's not a good thing, but it's the fact that, you know, we are living longer, you know, cancers are being cured. Um, and the next one you know, that's going to be coming in is neurodegenerative diseases uh, because of that, 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 that is the population it affects is the it's older people so it's really important that we come up with treatments and possibly cures i think the um, ones the i mean you mentioned it earlier um and i think when i've seen people for example on social media are like raising money they're running a marathon um they've got someone very close oh. to them that's possibly been diagnosed with parkinson's disease but then they are then, if you'd like to help, you know, donate, I'm raising money for Alzheimer's UK or the Alzheimer's Society, mm. I can't remember the name. And I'm just wondering, is there a difference yeah. between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's or are they intertwined? Or I think you get a lot of, yeah. I mean, there's a bit of people kind of, I don't know whether it's confusion or it's, are they the same? You know, that's a really good question. They're, they're not the same. Um, Alzheimer's disease is a dementia. So it affects your memory. But you, uh, well, the most, the most. So Alzheimer's is the most common that affects your memory. Um, other versions of dementias are something like Pick's disease that um, affects your frontal temporal lobe and gives you personality changes, but it's still a form of dementia. Um, you've got things like Broca's aphasia, which I believe Bruce Willis has, uh, where you start to not be unable to speak. Um, it's just a different type of, uh, of, I guess, uh, loss of cells. Um, but no, Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease are different. But that doesn't. So when you have Parkinson's disease, uh, there's also a bit of an increase of possibly getting dementia, but specifically Alzheimer's like like dementia, so cognitive decline. Um, which I think possibly for some people, when I've been talking to people, that is the scariest thing. The movement is is really unpleasant, but losing your movement and then also having dementia is almost like a double whammy. So I think for a lot of people who are viewing it, the movement maybe 
is is bad but then on top of that the family members are seeing them losing themselves almost so it's possible that people think okay i want to help with the alzheimer's um and also help with the parkinson's but there can be some crossover absolutely yeah that's how it. common is the crossover in this oh well, i guess in that sense Ooh. Oh, um, I don't know specifically Alzheimer's disease and um, and Parkinson's disease, um, but within Parkinson's disease, I believe it's it's higher than um, it's it's higher. I can't remember the exact numbers. That might come back to me later on in the podcast, but it's it's definitely higher. Um, so, for example, I'm doing a study looking at cognitive decline. Yeah. And so you can't, um, I think my next question was really just going to be, you know, you mentioned there's cures for cancer. Mm -hmm. Is there a cure for Parkinson's disease then? There's not, no. Uh, currently, there's, there's nothing that stops it. There's, um, I mean, this past year, there's been some very early uh, clinical trials. Um, it's called UB312. And it's a vaccine, which is meant to basically cause an immune response. So almost similar, you know, but in the brain. But imagine um, if you have a cold, for example, uh, you know, you're unwell, your body creates that immune response to kind of kill and get rid of that cold and create antibodies. And antibodies are the thing that comes and fights and get, gets rid of that um, virus or whatever it be, may be. But in um, the brain, if they're hoping with this vaccine, that it will um, fight these uh, ACE nuclein aggregates or little clumps of proteins I spoke about before that spread throughout the brain and uh, cause problems in the basal ganglia. It's very early, so they're, they're still kind of working on it, but it's quite, it's, it's probably, it's, it's on its way to hopefully helping. <laughs> I wanted to ask a question, sort of going back to the biology of it, because we spoke about um, do like it's a reduction in the dopamine to an extent, um, and that's associated with initially with movement problems. Mm -hmm. Could you, when we think about dopamine generally, we think about it as you know, along with serotonin, as like the pleasure drug or yeah, um, oh sorry, the pleasure neurotransmitter or things like that. It's not really associated with movement. Yeah. Um, could you like explain? Does dopamine have multiple roles? Um, yeah. Does this does Parkinson's also show like mood problems or like mood disorders because of the reduced dopamine? How does that sort of yeah. link in together? No, that's a great question. And then from that question, I can move into the clinical actually a little bit more. So no, it doesn't just. You're absolutely right. It doesn't most people do think you know? I mean, I think a drug that we know kind of affects affects those systems is uh, cocaine. Um, that one of the and it, it targets a pleasure center. There is so the substantia nigra creates this dopamine which feeds into the movement area. But there were other parts of the brain that also produce dopamine. So with that area that's involved in the pleasure centers, it's called the ventral tegmental area. I'll call it VTA. Don't have to remember it, but it's there if you want to look a little bit more into it. And that does affect um, yeah, the pleasure centers. But also when um, people are first diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, um, they tend to show tremor and the three symptoms of bradykinesia, which is slowness of movement, rigidity, which is, you know, like kind of rigid movement and tremor, that, um, yeah, which is tremor. And the first port of call when somebody's diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, they're given something called L-DOPA. And this increases, uh, there's, there's different ways that you can give dopamine um, and it's affecting the neurotransmitter. Now, the neurotransmitter is where the neuro is it the neuro is the neurotransmitters is is what's that was the dopamine and the synapse is where that is released and it affects the synapse so you know one great way is like thinking like the synapse is the bus terminal and the buses is the dopamine um and i imagine just that there's a reduction in buses but the terminal is still there so what you try and do is you try and send in either you can um block the um the part of the synapse so that the buses can't go back to the synapse so they keep keep re-triggering and uh and uh doing their job over and over and over again or you can just send in more dopamine 
So just you're just sending in lots more buses um, is uh, one way. But um, and that will help them with the with some of the symptoms such as tremor and bradykinesia. So so it's a movement. But what we also find sometimes when we give people L-DOPA is uh, their moods increase. Um, sometimes mm-hmm. rarely they can get also um, uh, hallucinations um, can be an effect of that. And that's because one theory of schizophrenia, for example, is an increase in dopamine. So when you increase dopamine, you can get hallucinations. Um, you can also get uh, impulse control disorders. And that means these people who are perfectly, you know, normal citizens go and become gamblers, sex addicts. And it's almost like that because that, that increase of dopamine is causing that. It's, these are very rare, but they are sometimes uh, caused by the cell dopa. But because of that lack of dopamine, you're right. So here, sometimes um, there is depression is really common as well. So within my studies, I'm also looking at mood, so anxiety and depression. Um, and I'm purposefully doing it before I've given them drugs to see, so the drugs haven't, won't have affected won't have any won't have affected the their dopamine at all. So I will be looking at their mood and seeing if this dopamine loss is affecting their mood as well. So I guess because there's no cures for Parkinson's, uh, maybe this is coming on to your PhD now. So then, what 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 are you trying to do? I suppose in your research. So I think just going on a little bit, there are no cures at the moment, but there are a few more treatments. I think one of the most common ones I want to very briefly discuss is I've spoken, you know, a little bit about uh, L-DOPA, but there's actually something called deep brain stimulation that I think a lot of people are interested by. It's these videos that you see people with quite advanced Parkinson's disease, you know, really have, have quite a pronounced tremor and suddenly something's switched and it just completely stops. And that's when you can go for brain surgery and it's later on in the disease when it starts to get quite unmanageable some of the symptoms and the L-DOPA will at some points not work as well Um, when you know those neurons are completely depleted and there's basically nothing yet even if the dopamine was there there's nothing it can connect to to work Um, so basically it's putting uh, some little electrodes into the basal ganglia and giving it small amounts of current and this stops the tremor basically so that's another one that's really important um and that shows us that there are treatments that are still you know incredibly helpful and can help you know years after diagnoses um in terms of um with my uh, phd i think it's there's two kind of things i kind of want to learn a little bit more about the first one is understanding the Bi- biologically what is happening a little bit more so half of my uh, study I would say is I'm using neuroimaging um, which I'll talk a little bit more after this but basically I want to look at the so gray matter and white matter in the brain so within the brain you've got gray and white matter the gray matter is the gray part um, on the uh, that you'll see, you, if you were to cut it open, you'd see it kind of like around the outside and a little bit in the centre as well. And this is oh, basically, pink. Uh, they, <laughs> yeah, they, they're pink <laughs> on the outside, maybe. Um, and this is where all the uh, the kind of the the thought is happening. All of the um, all the cell bodies are in there, and when I say cell bodies, that's where all the action is happening. And then the white matter is how those parts of the grey matter or those cell bodies communicate with each other. So the brain needs to connect up because the brain has different parts which is needed for everyday, you know, goings on. So, for example, I'm, you know, moving my hand. If I say hi to somebody, I'm moving my hand. So the initiation is the basal ganglia, but then it needs to go up to the motor cortex so that I know to move my right hand and wave. And then also I need the frontal lobe to make the decision to wave and memory to see that that's my friend over there who I am waving at, which is the temporal lobes a little bit lower. So it needs to be able to connect up with each other, which is really important. So there's lots been done on the gray matter areas because that's, you know, the hub of it. That's where it all happens. But I want to look a little bit more about the white matter. So a great analogy that I'm sure Sahir will have will know, it's about train tracks and train stations. So the white matter is the tracks and how it all connects up. And some of those tracks maybe haven't been looked after properly or a little bit damaged, or they might be running extra time. So they're a little bit larger or they're compensating 
for something that's happening upstream. So I'm understanding what's happening within the white matter uh, within people with very early Parkinson's disease. So very early in the disease course. Now for me, I think if we look at very early in the disease course, that's a time when we can really help people. The symptoms aren't so awful that they're affecting. The, it's, you know, there's, there, there might be a little bit of tremor. There might be a little bit of rigidity, um, a little bit unstable on their feet, but it's still early enough that they can still enjoy their lives. So if I understand what's going on that, at that very, very, very early stage, I think that's a time when we can really still help people. So at that point, the with the basal ganglia, that cell loss, we're looking at around 50 to 60% cell loss. So that means there's still some cells in there. But two things, and then for the second part that I want to kind of understand a little bit more. So the first part is understand what's happening in that white matter and very, very early on, and possibly if we can figure that out, how can that lead to treatments and just tells us biological mechanisms. But on top of that, if we're not seeing changes until 50 to 60% of that cell loss, why is that? You would think, you know, 10% cell loss, we'd see some kind of changes in movement. We don't. So what's happening in the brain? The brain is really resilient and it's smart. So when you have something going wrong, the brain will compensate. It will find another way to do it. And it will only really start to show the clinical changes. So the tremor or the bradykinesia um, very, you know, when it absolutely can't compensate or do anything more. So I'm trying to look at what possible areas of the brain could be helping with movement. Um, because the basal ganglia is struggling does that make sense no it makes sense i mean you 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 keep referring to sort of like the movement side of things Mm -hmm. but then it's a neurodegenerative disease so is it neurodegenerative because the problem with movement is starting in the brain Oh, so it's neurodegenerative. So when I say neurodegenerative, what I mean is, so this is the difference between Parkinsonism and Parkinson's disease. When you have a Parkinsonism, that doesn't necessarily mean it's neurodegenerative. And what that means is it's not going to get worse over time. If you have Parkinson's disease, that cell loss is only going to get worse and worse and worse over time, similar with Alzheimer's disease. And this might be a stupid question, but could they not just pump loads of new cells into you? Unfortunately, not. No, they have. They have actually tried some stem cell research where they. Uh, but there's two things with that. It's very difficult to create stem cells that you can insert in your brain and will stay, because your brain, um, if it notices anything is in there that it shouldn't be, it, you'll get an um, infl- <laughs> inflammation, and that will uh, basically destroy your brain. It'll absolutely attack your brain. So your brain attacks itself because it, it says this thing shouldn't be here and it's it's dangerous. Um, and it's just very hard to make those cells as well. You have to, they're, I won't go into too much detail on this, but within stem cells, they're some of the earliest forms of cells that, you know, you get, you know, when you're, when you're in, when you're a fetus, basically. So we don't, we don't produce those. Later yeah. On. I always just think of, you know, how they've like grown ears and <laughs> Yeah, so that that is that is part of the reason that that, that is there was lots of research into it, and it's important research because that's absolutely so that's why it's a good question, Pollyanna. Because yeah, people are looking at that. It's just it's yeah. fiddly, shall we say? <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> there's there's another one which on the same lines is gene therapy. So I assume because yeah. everybody doesn't get Parkinson's, like like you said, potentially one in thirty seven. That's still one in thirty seven. That means there's a genetic sort of element to it right not everybody gets it so can't you yeah. sort of turn off those genes or so I can give you some good examples for this actually so yeah um they be- well so far they think that it's around 10 to 15 percent of uh of Parkinson's disease is genetic that they can say this is genetic and they know the genetic uh the, the gene that is kind of causing that so mm-hmm. for example there's two of the most common genetic causes it's something called GBA and lurk two but they are two different uh genetic mutations but they they cause parkinson's disease in different ways so just to give you a very quick example because i think this is quite an understandable example with gba basically um it no longer it's a it no longer creates a, a protein called gba and you need that protein 
and two other proteins to combine together to eradicate all of it. If you don't have this third protein, this GBA protein, you have these two proteins that just kind of like, like that just kind of can't, can no longer be dissolved. So this is what cause, causes um, problems and then like such as the alpha synuclein that builds up, becomes insoluble because you don't have something that it's called catalyzing the reaction and dissolving it. Um, so that's, we know that that causes that, which is of course a problem. Um, but because we've got things like LIC2, SNCA is another one, um, they all cause Parkinson's disease in different ways. And it's usually, yeah, like it affects the mitochondria, for example. Mm -hmm. But because it's not one exact way that these these um, genetic mutations are causing Parkinson's disease, they still can't pinpoint an idiopathic. Idiopathic means that just an unknown cause causes it. Um, so that's yeah but it's a very good question like you'd think that we should know by now and we do use these genetic uh, mutations as a uh, as example or just differences um as to kind of study it a little bit further and see if we can find drugs that uh, target these areas but they don't always work and there's not been too there's not been very much um luck with them yet so i think that's why now they're trying to target just alpha synuclein because they know that that's the issue um, um yeah with the vaccine I mean that's that's very very interesting because it, it you're kind of saying Parkinson's disease is not like one disease with the exact same thing It's like the symptoms are the same but the underlying causes yeah. are potentially very different each time yeah. and therefore the treatments very different each time. Yeah. Um, I think that's so actually just to give a little more actually with Parkinson's disease although I've mentioned yeah it's a movement disorder no two cases are the same it's inc incredibly heterogeneous so very different cases all throughout it always has to have movement disorders but i could list off about another 10 symptoms that go along with it i will even list them off now so autonomic dysfunction whether that's problem problems with your urinary tract or constipation uh autonomic dysfunction can also be problems with your sleep so you can get something called rbd which is rapid eye movement behavioral disorder and basically that's when you dream you don't have something stopping you from almost living out your dreams so people are all out you know they're moving their hands they're uh, they're walking they're almost like sleepwalking then you can also have depression anxiety psychosis there is so many extra um symptoms that a lot of people don't realize cognitive decline is one that i'm currently looking at it's uh it's so multifaceted and that could be the fact that it's um and that's another part of my research is where i'm trying to group certain people with certain symptoms a little bit better to understand the, like the biology behind that a bit better because there's a big people start well it's been going on for a while now people think you can't can you just look at parkinson's disease because no two cases are the same we we'll probably have to look a little bit better and, under, and look at something called personalized medicine a little bit more that's where if no two cases are the same we have to take this person their symptoms and treat them specifically uh, yeah, to help them how do you you know I think when it comes to something like cancer everyone is very aware of it um anyway it's one of those things where the more people are aware of it um you kind of get for example in people that are perhaps slightly more pre predisposed to sort of anxiety etc or or have um anxiety conditions you know because there's so there's a lot of awareness of cancer and there's a sort of awareness and knowledge that oh if this is hurting it must be cancer you know it's that classic mm -hmm. thing if you google your symptoms and it tells you you have cancer what is is there a fear that you know you talk about cancer there's cures coming for that and so the next second biggest one is then parkinson's disease then how do you avoid a moral panic where if someone essentially has a uti a urinary tract infection how do you stop them from assuming the worst and that they've got parkinson's like is that going to happen yeah no, that's a good question so things like uti and constipation are just something that a minority have or not that many people have and it's not it wouldn't be the only symptom it would be like an extra so so we've got something what you call prodromal parkinson's disease that means that it's, it's before you can see the movement uh changes um so it's called prodromal 
But um, if you were to scan these people using something called a DAT scan, you could see that there was starting to be some um, loss of dopamine, but it hadn't yet affected their movement. And there's probably the most common risk factor and the most common symptom that I've just briefly discussed was the rapid eye movement behavioral disorder. We'll call it RBD, which is that if you have that then that's it doesn't mean you're going to get parkinson's disease but it's common enough that you want to get yourself to the doctors and monitor it um you know there's been a couple of people that i've scanned recently who have who started with rbd and they then went on to get parkinson's disease um so it's and so it, i guess what's the symptom then that people uh, you know is it people waking up one day and suddenly they've got tremors and then they get diagnosed or is it you know, you wake up one day and you've got like, you know, a bit of a twitchy eye and then it takes yep. six months before it's like, oh, no, you know, and your doctor dismisses you the first time because it's like, oh, you probably just slept on it funny. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm not a clinician, but um, I think from what I can tell, well, but I've, I, when it is, but it's, it's, it's insidious. It actually, the tremor isn't always straight away. It's, it's slow. It's very slow. And then it's just been like, yeah, six months or a year. And they're like, that tremor's not gone away. And then it's slowly getting worse and worse. There was... um. A woman who came in who, you know, said like she hadn't really noticed anything, but she was painting. And when she painted, she noticed that there was the tremor there when she was trying to paint. And she said, mm, that wasn't there before. And it, it was there for about six months. So that's that's what, you know, it was doing everyday activities where I think people start to realize. And it's not always you that realizes because, you know, because it's insidious and it's happening slowly. You just think it's the norm. It's actually usually relatives that start to notice some of the, the movements the movement issues um yeah so that's probably but the rbd the, if you were to get things at like rbd and sometimes there's something called anosmia which means you lose your sense of smell a little bit there's mm -hmm. also another one that kind of it's a little bit of a prodroma one but uh, you know that's can also be quite common for other other reasons such as covid19 great names you know anosmia for the anosmia no. just can't smell <laughs> <laughs> um i suppose i mean it's it goes into an entirely different topic and probably a whole other podcast episode but then I imagine with a loneliness epidemic that we are seeing yeah. you're going to get less cases being known because like you say if, pe if people rely on others to point it out you might just end up with people not even realizing um and I think the the other thing as well then so when you go to the doctors and you're like right I've got this tremor do you have to go for an MRI can they do a blood test like how do you get diagnosed yeah that's a great question um so it's actually a clinical diagnosis um, so that means the clinician, the clinician will diagnose it and they have either, they will, some clinicians who I know who are just so, you know, they've seen so many cases, it's almost like they just go up, ask a couple of questions and they, you know, ask them a couple of, to do a couple of tasks and they just know that like, you do have Parkinson's disease and, um, but then there's something called the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale, UPDRS that can tell you a little bit more about those symptoms and the extent of them. But saying that um, Parkinson's disease is not the only movement disorder. So there's some other rarer ones. They're called Parkinson's plus syndromes. An example of that is something called uh, PSP or multi-systems atrophy that look very similar to Parkinson's disease. They're a lot more, usually a lot more aggressive. So if you have one of those, it, it, the survival rate is, is or the, quality of life isn't as great and survival rate isn't as long but they can prevent it very similar and if they think that they they might have one of those diseases absolutely that's when you'd use something called you'd look at you probably want something called a dat scan that can show you uh, that there is one-sided loss of the dopamine neurons which is is what parkinson's disease is how you can identify parkinson's disease a little bit better or if you're unsure but a big problem is uh, these stats scans are expensive. They're very expensive, so they won't always uh, put people in for a scan because it's just too expensive. And if it can be diagnosed with a clinician, then that's what they'll do. Because um, you said you work with neuroimaging, um, and you, and we're talking about this sort of slow change, which I guess family members notice over time and things like that. Do you? Can you see these changes in neuroimaging? So have, um, I do not know exactly what 
you do, but if you've had patients come in multiple times, can you kind of see progression? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great question to hear. Um, so there's different types of imaging. Um, I'll just give you a quick whistle stop tour of a few of them that might be important for this. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Some, <laughs> so something called PET scans, which is positron emission tomography. Tomography. Um, and this is basically where. Uh, now these are probably they've been around for absolutely tens of years and basically it's where you can tag the uh, neurotransmitters with um with basically radioactively um it's minimal so it doesn't affect the page it doesn't you know it's not going to cause any kind of like radi radiation poisoning um but it tags it then you put them in the scanner and the scanner can pick up pick up on that radiation so it shows like the uh, clumps of the neurotransmitter dopamine and this you can look at many others just to briefly say as well dopamine is not the only neurotransmitter that is affected in parkinson's disease i'm just focusing on it for this because it, otherwise it'll start to get a lot more complicated um so you can tag the dopamine and then it will almost come it will come up like with this like very colorful brain and if it's red that means there's lots of lots of dopamine there but if it's a uh, small you know if there's smaller pockets of it it means that you can see that there's there's a reduction in that neurotransmitter really important because i could just tell you about the transition and that absolutely can tell you um it can tell you how advanced the disease stage is in parkinson's disease but you will probably see that um after you know 50 to 60 percent that also does mimic um their their kind of their symptoms so you know if you've got less of that less of the dopamine after about 56 percent loss as that kind of gets less and less and less it will the symptoms will get worse and worse and worse the one that I use, but just say that one's very expensive. And on top of that, it's, um, there is, although it's, you know, you know, radio, radioactive materials can cause cancer, you know, it's, it's fine to have a few scans of that, but that you can't have many more than, I believe maybe one or two a year, really. So you can't really use that. So scans that I use something called MRI. And this basically just looks at the structure of the brain. It's like taking a picture of the brain. Um, so we're just looking at the structure. Um, so these are only kind of like big changes in the brain. So, um, but we've got technology now, which if I put it through a computer, it can it can sometimes detect very small changes, and I can look at different different groups and see if there are any changes. Within that, you don't tend to see a lot of changes until the disease is quite advanced. Um, although the research that I've just done recently, um, I did find some differences in the cerebellum and healthy um, in healthy controls. The cerebellum is an area that's for coordination. And therefore for movement um, so that's using structure you can also use when i talked about the white matter pathways that mainly looks at gray matter the t ones um and then the other one is diffusion just what you need to know is called it dti it looks at the water molecule composition and that looks at the white matter tracks and yeah we do tend to see some changes within the white matter tracks because it's a little bit more you're pulling it apart a little bit further especially in one called the corticospina tract um, and especially early in the disease is uh, interesting, but that just tells us it, it, that just tells us information about what's happening in the brain. You wouldn't necessarily use that for diagnosis. That just tells us biological me mechanisms. So the PET scan is the only one that's used for really clinical diagnosis. We're not quite there yet with the other ones. And my question now is: so Kim Kardashian used Pranuvo in the US. Yes. which is a company that is basically it's MRI scans for the public. You pay two and a half grand mm. to go and have yeah. an MRI. Um, when that then comes and grows and, you know, as a business, I think they've gone through several rounds of venture capital funding. When it, you know, at some point in society becomes a place where those with the money are able to go and just pay for their own MRI, is that helpful or is that a hindrance to to the work that say you're doing like is it useful to go and have everyone go and pay for an mri or is that just going to cause a moral panic <laughs> uh, so yeah it's a, it's a diff that is a really good question and it's a debate to be had i think so do you know I'm, as an example the um you can have uh so you might you can have changes in your brain that don't necessarily present clinically and might never mean anything um sometimes when you see things on a scan, for example, some little white matter hyperintensities, which can be linked to um, multiple sclerosis, doesn't mean they're causing clinical problems. They're just there. It's just 
it hasn't affected you in any way. Sometimes we can have little micro strokes. It doesn't affect us, they, but they're there. They're just like little white, white matter hyperintensities. Are we scaring people by doing these brain scans? But at the same time, you're right, is it good to check and stop before before you know it uh, gets you know causes you know you know it, it, um, well yeah i think we're changes. we're we're brought up in and this is definitely a, a uk thing i don't know whether it's the same in other countries but we are a very reactive health society so we react the minute something's you know it's we we don't want to trouble the doctor we don't want to trouble you know fill up a hospital bed like unless you're on death's door and I think we're sort of told about that from a very early age and now we're kind of in this interesting space where you're now looking at preventative care and how can we you know stop filling up the hospitals with things that maybe could have been prevented in the past and so yeah I suppose it's just quite an interesting piece that maybe there's sort of two sides to my question it's almost on the one hand is it good that anyone can in the future will be able to just go and get an MRI but then on the flip side it's like is there a point where you get people coming to you who are part of your research who've been diagnosed who could have been diagnosed six years earlier but they just didn't want to bother anybody I guess there's two things here I guess almost on a moral grounds as well how expensive are the scans they're not cheap who's going to be able to afford them I um, guess, yeah. sorry, uh, I guess the, would you say, the the free markets, whatever argument for that would be that if enough people start doing it, the prices will go down because more companies yeah. would also want to do it. But then yeah. we're getting into this very sketchy area of uh, like sort of public, like privacy, like privacy issues of like your health data because at the moment, if you do scans, if scans are done by like the NHS or if they're done for research, then they kept under lock and key. Nobody else has them. Um, yeah. the, but if you start giving it to private companies, what will they do with the data and information? Um, what are they telling you? Because do they have clinicians who are going to meet the person and tell them that, okay, this is nothing to worry about. Like Beth said, you have, you could have like mini strokes and things which mean nothing really, but yeah. Uh, so it's two sides to it, which everybody sort of needs to be able to, yeah, deal with at some point. We haven't dealt with AI. We haven't dealt with the internet, really. So I, I, don't, I don't know how we would deal with just everybody having everyone's brain scans and health data. Yeah. I mean, some some would argue that we, that's like the, the biobank has thousands of brain scans. So I think they're very much so on, you know, yeah, we just scan everybody and we, uh, but there was a, yeah, there was a little bit of yeah uproar with that recently, I believe. Um, but they're you know people who you know run the biobank are I do, they are very conscious and they're as far as why they don't sell their the data to um, big companies. But yeah, it's I think it's always a fear. It's like twenty three and me, isn't it? When if you found out you've got some kind of uh, I don't know, like um, genetic link to um, Huntington's, for example, um, you know. You don't want you don't really want people to find out about that. Um, it was twenty three and me selling their data. Yeah, it's a moral moral problem. <laughs> <laughs> that got deep. Uh... Yeah, very deep. <laughs> Any excuse to bring up Kim Kardashian in an episode? I knew it. <laughs> Fair. Fair enough. It's 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 also scary. I. I don't know how keen I am on people having Instagram stories of their brain scans. Uh, yeah. Might be a funny thing to like or dislike or point out. I uh, guess I, personally, I, I don't want to, I don't think I want to see what, you know, is on my brain. Cause I don't know what if I had something just slightly, you know, that we wasn't expecting. Would I want to know? Would I not want to know? What if it was just a difference compared to anybody else's brain, but it didn't really mean anything. But it, yeah, I think it can cause fear. It, but especially, especially because, like you said, the brain is very uh, flexible in terms of, like we were talking about in Parkinson's, mm. 50% of the matter has, around 50-60% of the matter goes before you start showing symptoms. That means that just because a brain image looks like looks one way doesn't mean that the brain isn't functioning well. Exactly. It's compensating yeah. best it can. Yeah, yeah like um, there's, what, there's a case of a, somebody who was only born with, half half the hemisphere so one half of their brain 
and they were functioning perfectly fine, but because they were a child, something we call plasticity, uh, and they were fine. Awesome. Shall we? I I had a few more questions about your research, actually. Um, yeah, of course. So, I, so could you like run me through one of your participants if they have to come into your experiment? What yeah. sort? What's what does it look like? Because you did say that you do some cognitive stuff. You did yeah. say you put them through an MRI. If you could take me through, yeah, the journey of, of uh, participants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll take you through the whole thing. Um, so first of all, I'll call them up. Um, they've been um, uh, already recommended by the consultant I'm working with. And then she will say they're happy to be approached about this. I'll approach them, send them all the documentation about what we're going to do. And then they'll say yes or no. Then I do a quick little check to make sure there's nothing. They've got no um, pacemakers or tattoo or piercings uh, so that they definitely couldn't have a scan. And Can you not have a scan if you have a tattoo? So very old tattoos, uh, no. It can, it, they can be fine. Uh, there is a pigment. It's, I think it's they use a pigment that is, uh, it's got... Metal, no, no, you're fine. I think it's pre nineteen seventy five, uh, so it's 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 old, and they're usually almost always fine, but um, still need access things. And then I will book them in. They will come in. First thing I'll do is say hello. Um, I will uh, then take them through the consent forms, um, and you know, the, the, then the radiographer will come out and t- take them through some more consent forms to make sure they're definitely okay to go in the scanner. Because uh, the MRI scanner, if anything's in there which is uh, yeah, metal, uh, it, it it will absolutely you know fly towards machine because it's a big magnet. Uh, so it has to be very careful. That's what we take in there. Uh, yeah, then they'll come through. Uh, the radiographer will uh, give them a gown. They get changed into a gown, and then they will go into the scanner. Now the radiographer is very good because if some people haven't had this before, it can be quite claustrophobic and scary. So we'll talk them through it and say it's going to be about 50 minutes. Uh, and what's nice with the one that I do, there's a little eight to nine minute video at the end. So people know right at the end that that's when it's going to you know, be almost finished. So then we put them in the scanner, make sure they're all okay. Then we go to the little room in the back and we run them in the scanner. They just have, they just lie there um, and it's, it can be quite loud. So they're giving, ear, giving earplugs as well. They can just relax for 50 minutes. They don't really have to do anything. Then once they've done that, we'll take them out and they'll get changed. And then I'll take them to um, one of the side rooms. And first of all, I will give them a, it's called a hospital anxiety and depression uh, scale. So it's a question that they can fill out themselves just on their current mood. It takes about five minutes just, and it just shares some very, um, just a quick overview of their anxiety and depression. And then the next one I do is a looking at their uh, cognition this one takes a bit longer it's about 20 25 minutes and it looks at lots of different areas from their cognition so for example language memory um visual spatial so how they kind of uh, must view the world their fluency um yeah and then we'll take them through that and then at the end i was asking them, do you have any questions and that is it done it takes about an hour and a half two hours and do that per per subject or person <laughs> I've I've been in an MRI scanner before. It's not fun, that experience. Yeah, the I think was yeah. Sorry to hear. Uh, no, I I was just saying that they. I remember them giving me a buzzer to say if I was uncomfortable, yeah. and I thought I had been in there for fifteen minutes, and I was pressing it, and they said you've been in here for a minute and a half. It's not been that long. <laughs> Calm down. If, if you were to invent the perfect MRI machine, then what what would it do? What, what would it look like? I mean, if we're not going to... So do you know what's really... At King's, I don't know if when we were at King's, they were actually coming up with a machine that basically was making it quieter. Uh, so it was a quieter MRI machine. And I remember, like, when I first I was first watching, I was like, oh, it doesn't seem like that much. And then when I started working with the MRI scanners, I was like, that is genius, because especially for children, it's scary. Mm-hmm. And it's also very claustrophobic, so I'd want it to be quieter, and I'd want it to be larger as well. It, it is really quite... Um, it can be really quite claustrophobic but um the people that have had to come in so far especially the people who have parkinson's disease are really keen to get involved so even when they are a little bit scared they're like nope there was one story in particular that just you know really does stay with me and a woman she was she was quite claustrophobic but she's like i want to do this and i will do this she was so determined um and you know i think sometimes this is the phrase you know that kind of you know kind of keeps me going with my interactions with her she's a very lovely woman um she you know was 
you know, had quite pronounced um, symptoms, but was still quite early. And I asked her, do you have any questions or anything, you know, last things you want to say or, or you know, if you want, just welcome to email me. And she just, you know, looked at me, grabbed my hand and, you know, started, you know, tearing up, crying and saying like, please, please, if you can just help one person with this scan, please, I will do a million scans for you because it's just the worst thing ever. And it was just, she was in her, you know, just, she was the same age as my mum. It was just, you know, heartbreaking. And I think seeing that, you know, really gives you, you know, motivation to kind of, you know, carry on with these things that, you know, we help with this because it's going to affect so many people. And it is, really affects the quality of life. Yeah, I can't even imagine. Mm. Um, do you, so then, like, like she said, if you could help one person, um, what what are you hoping for the outcomes of your current studies of your PhD, and yeah. how do you think that will go in helping? Yeah. Yeah. So, I think there's two two kind of ones I'm kind of like interested in the moment, or the ones that I'm kind of working on currently. Um, the first one, the stuff with the cerebellum, um, it's interesting because if basically it looks like there might be an increase of the cerebellum early, it very just say this is a this has not yet been um peer reviewed at all so but there's other studies that also uh back this up a little bit as well so it's not just me it's a really great study called um by Kara Karestes if people want to read it that's a peer reviewed article and they found increases in certain areas of the cerebellum very in the, in the earlier stages of Parkinson's disease so it's possible that sorry thinking... by increases do you mean like inflammation oh, like sorry. it gets bigger yeah. or not we don't think inflammation we actually think that it's um it's almost working harder is in it's it, there's increased uh, cell cells there um, and this is supported by uh, other research has looked at uh, the functionality between the basal ganglia and um the cere- oh sorry we've just looked at the at the func- so, like functionally there's an increase functionally as well which is su- suggesting that it's working harder and working harder to help with those most um keep those motor symptoms kind of um uh you know as as be- as best as they possibly can be considering the basal ganglia is uh degenerating so if we can possibly target cerebellum in the future that i mean this is way way thinking but for example we've got deep brain stimulation in the basal ganglia is another possible target area the cerebellum i wouldn't personally be working with that but is there possible treatment opportunities that come from this i think second of all because i'm within so with my with using neuroimaging i'm using particular um imaging which creates really high high quality white matter images so like when i say high matter um like high quality it's almost like you know you know with pixels when you take a picture it's you know like it's it's very it's very crisp images it means that we can see more and we can understand more so i want to look at those white matter pathways in excruciating detail basically and understand what is happening within this like entire space between the the areas that are being affected Um, and if I can kind of figure that out then I might be able to further um, I guess elucidate this idea that yes there is increased um, uh, communication possibly between the basal ganglia and the cerebellum and is that because it's needing the cerebellum to pick up on the slack, for example. So it's understanding why these pathways, which pathways are first being affected and why is that when we might see it in the white matter pathways first. So maybe we can target these areas. Just understand how we how we can move and compensate for so long. Mm-hmm. It's really interesting. Mm, I find it fascinating, but I'm, I'm biased. <laughs> <laughs> but also links to symptoms as well. Seeing what areas links to specific symptoms is probably. I was going to put it like in a, you know, one sentence. I want to look at the white matter pathways and the link to symptoms, um, and if we can see that that link, then maybe we can target those white matter pathways for those specific symptoms. As I said earlier, personalized medicine. So I would call it to decline. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I think that's a good sort of statement to end your research stuff on yeah yeah. um i i didn't want to spend the last five ten minutes talking about your science communication work yeah uh i came across a few talks you gave on youtube i've seen 
that recently you ran a neuroscience conference in Liverpool. Yes. So uh, could you talk to, tell people a little bit about how you got into, yeah, in, in your science communication journey a little bit, and then also considering you're a student, like what sort of dri- drives you and how I, I do you find time to do this? Yeah. No, I can, um, I'll start, um, I think probably quite, a nice one to start on is a little story that I think Pollyanna was here for about why I think it's so important to do science communications, especially with the public and the patients and everybody and getting the word out a little bit more understanding. So about five years ago, me and Pollyanna were, um, well, we were, I was on a, a Eurostar coming back from um, Paris and there was a woman who uh, was very scared. She was uh could have probably looked like a panic attack, but she was having a full psychotic break. She was probably about my age. Um, she was terrified. She was shaking. She was scared. Um, and people were laughing at her and they were being nasty. She was terrified. And I just, you know, I was like, this is, I was like, are you okay? She's like, and she was just, you know, absolutely like, they're looking at me. They're all looking at me. I was like, no one's looking at you. Let's, let's. And so, you know, somebody did help out, but then, you know, they, they got her somewhere else to sit, you know, where she'd be alone. She was very scared. She, yeah, again, my, you know, mid twenties probably. Um, and then when she left, there were just people being like, oh, I was about to kick her off this train. Like talking about, you know, physically hurting her and being just incredibly, you know, unkind. And I think that's when I kind of realized we need better perception from these diseases now that was probably psychosis but as i said it, it, it goes across all these diseases that you know we really do need better awareness so i think it starts as far back as that to be honest when i was like right we need to do better on this and then so when i started my phd i was like science communication is vital i want to be involved in the committees i want to be involved in the you know if there's any possibility of talks talking to patients i want to be there because it is so important that people are made aware and that, you know, just the public are aware, but also the patients are aware of what we're doing and, you know, how this can help them and how they're feeling getting their kind of feedback. So I think with the Fame Lab, I'd never really full on put myself out to do a full on talk, but I really enjoy talking very much so. And I enjoy talking about science. It's probably my favorite thing to do. I mean, this has just solidified that. But this um, this Fame Lab, I think, it's, which is the world's largest science communication competition, basically. So I put in an application it's basically where you have to for three minutes you have to talk um you can basically talk about anything but I chose I choose to talk about my research we have to make it engaging so it has to be charismatic has to have good content and has to be and has to have good clarity so I put in first a video entry that got accepted then I got through to the northwest finals in Liverpool that's between like Liverpool Manchester and North Wales which is great I won that and then I went to the final um and that was, you know, I mean, it was absolutely fantastic. You know, I was, it was my favorite thing. I was able to talk about Parkinson's disease. I was able to use neuroimaging to take people through the lifespan of somebody with Parkinson's disease and try to explain that, it, you know, it happens a lot earlier. You know, these changes happen, you know, 20 years before you might even see symptoms, but we just don't see it. And this is how neuroimaging, as you said previously, looking at these longitudinal changes, but explaining it in a way that people can understand why, why would you do this? So you know, when I did that kind of final fame lab, I sp- spoke a little bit about Michael J. Fox and those changes, because it's important that they understand why are we doing this research? Why would they even care about what we're doing? And why is it important to be aware that, you know, these people, are, you know, people with Parkinson's disease are, go- are going through this and just to understand a little bit more science around it. Why would you not want to, you know, know a bit more about that? Fantastic experience. Um, I mean, I think over well over 400 people applied and there was eight of us at the end. So it was... Um, it's very enjoyable. It's very enjoyable. It's very important that we, you know, keep, you know, that people get excited about science. And I think that to me is just what science is about. Let's get people excited. Let's chat about it. Let's, you know, tell me if it's too complicated. Tell me if, you know, it's, you know, it's it's some things, um, you know, too complicated, you know, it just is not making sense. You know, there is no blonde questions. I think somebody said this to me, you know, like, I'm sorry if it's a blonde question. I'm like, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as a stupid question, please. If I'm not, if you're not understanding it, it's on me. It's not on you. I think sometimes people feel so stupid, you know, coming to the science community when it should not be the way. So that's what kind of got me into it a little bit there with the science communications. And how do um, you stop the... I guess because we've never had more information than at our fingertips than ever before. Mm, if I want to yes. go and find something out, I can go on Google, TikTok, Perplexity, ChatGPT, 
Pinterest. Do you know what I mean? So, mm. and then that's not even counting like the, the the TV programs, the podcasts, the whatnot. How do you, or how how can people be sort of empowered to go to the right sources and and understand that they get like so so we're not spreading misinformation basically. Yeah. That's a really good question, Pauline, because I think misinformation is like with, with the internet is such a problem. I think this is the exact reason why science has to be more accessible. Because um, otherwise yeah. we just, you know, we will read what is on the internet and just be like, oh, well, there's no scientists. You know, they, they, they use all these big words think that we won't understand. But no, 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 it's this. And rather than, I think sometimes, I mean, for me personally, an approach is you don't just, you know, bam, saying like, no, you're wrong. It's all about understanding so being diplomatic, I say, why do you think that? No, it's, I'm not saying, it's it's never about outright saying you're wrong because it's if you sit, tell someone you're wrong, it's it's combative. You know, it's like, why do you think that? You know, let's talk through it. I can tell you why it's right. You know, let's set up these lines of communication about, you know, that, that piece of information that seems very plausible is wrong and dangerous. And let's, but, you know, discuss also your point of view and why you think that. And that doesn't mean even as wild as it can be there's not what how have you got that information and I'm sure there will be a little nugget that has gone you know further and further back that is fueling that line of thinking so it's just discussing it a bit further so I do pint of science as well is another great one where we can uh you know get scientists involved it's it's, it's like fame lab but on a smaller scale where around the city we set up these talks with people you know on their research but again it's for it's quite nice because it means like people, that local people local Local people can come and listen to scientists around their area talk about their research that they're doing. Um, yeah, so I helped organise that as well, and that's you know another really fantastic way to you know share all this information. Um, we've got the British Neuroscience Association Festival that's coming up to Liverpool next year, which is really exciting. I hope I'm going to see you there, so here. Um, <laughs> and that you know I'm working with Everton in the community to try and uh, you know, work with those communities from the football club. You know who. They you know, they have groups of people with Parkinson's disease. Work a lot with them, uh, um, uh, neurodiver people who are neurodivergent. Um, you know, there's all sorts of these groups you know that we need to work better with, and you know, we're very keen to kind of bring that into the festival as well. It's just about it's about learning, but it's not just. I think with science, sometimes we need to listen. You know. If, if we're just, you know, speaking and speaking and speaking, and, you know, I think it's quite easy as a scientist to, you know, you have to defend your work so rigorously and you have to be so confident that it's so important that we just sit back and listen and be like, okay, I'm I'm going to listen to what you're going to say, even though, you know, I've been told I have to be right. I'm not always right, but I'm happy to listen to what you have to say. And then I can talk you through my line of thinking it's just about listening and learning but a bit of backwards and forwards I think um yeah it's very important do you think science needs to sort of change the way we disseminate we disseminate information um because I I personally have, have found it it takes a long time, and there's good reason for it as well, um, just to defend how research works. The whole, the whole making sure everything's peer reviewed, making sure everything is there's as as tight as can be. You don't have any sort of there's no sort of like yeah data manipulation. There isn't all that kind of nonsense going on. Requires quite a bit of time, but mm. misinformation spreads a lot faster. Um, and then also, I guess the way scientific journals are, or where a lot of science is published, is in places which people cannot actually access or read them, yeah. uh, which does not help countering any narratives which are formed. Um, so, in your opinion, do you think we need to change? Science, researchers need to change their approach. Um, and also, as a science communicator, how do you think you would uh, change? You would do this. Or how would if Beth was in charge of disseminating all the sciences, how, how would it work? <laughs> I, I, I think we do do relatively well. I think, you know, we have things like, you know, the science festivals, Cheltenham Science Festival, but I think, and there are, you know, a lot of science museums that, you know, do it beautifully. Um, but I think sometimes, yeah, with the bigger research, you know, you write like the peer reviewing, the, the scientific papers. I even struggle to understand them sometimes. It's, 
it's making sure we disseminate those, you know, in a clear fashion and, you know, how does it affect people? I think, I think we're getting there with it. And I do think, you know, there is a lot of, you know, where people are very keen to, um, well, not actually I say this, you know, I'm, I say it because I'm very keen, you know, for, to teach people. But I think sometimes, you know, there's this whole idea of, you know, I think I, this is gone now though, you know, like, you know, everyone looks, you know, like Einstein who does a uh, science, uh, you know, they're all, everyone's like in their fifties and, you know, in their kind of stuffy offices. But I think there is like, there is definitely a change with like younger communicators coming out and, you know, wanting to change it. You know, this. I think what's really interesting is recently I was looking at um, possibly going to Green Man Festival and uh, they've got a whole you know, tent that is science related. It's science related talks, but I think it's actually, I think it should almost be mandatory that every single PhD student has to give a public lecture somewhere. Um, whether that's to you know 10 people or 20 people 500 people I think that will really help them kind of you know not dumb it down because I think that's right but even if or even you know as a president you know part of part of their PhD has to be that they can deliver this information to people who are not scientists or even patient groups so you know because then you can kind of understand the nuances of it of you know how you speak to people from that you know from there you know possibly with that disease I mean I'm talking about it because I with people with um diseases but it it then can you know i think it's a skill that's really important so then you when we're at parties we're not just talking about you know the in-depth okay, scary you know like the substantia niagara pars compacta and the subthalamic nucleus and the thalamus and it's disinhibition and it's you know it's all a little bit much um so the more we practice i think the more it will get better <laughs> Well, we should ask the marketing person here, Pollyanna, what do you think? <laughs> um, no, I think, I know that Beth and I, we have spoken about this before. You know, I think it even comes down to our brains process visuals a lot easier than they do, uh, like audio, for example. Um, and then most people, again, you know, pictures are louder than words. And I think if I then apply that to how I see the academic and science community. I don't know who is reading 25 page long or 50,000 word journals and papers. No one. Um, apart from it's just it's like a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy of just scientists reading scientists work. Yeah. Um, Sorry, Pollyanna, can I just confirm you're saying nobody's going to read my thesis, my 100 page thesis when it's when it's completed? No, there's not going to be tens of people, hundreds of people reading that. Um, <laughs> no, I... not unless you know, but having said <laughs> all of that, um, just before you continue, I, I remember reading somewhere that on average four people read your uh, read a journal article you publish, so that's, that's on low. average. Wow, so... that's scary, but I think uh, that doesn't uh... negate doing the research. I think there's there's two different sides here, there's a, there's a need to do the research. But then it's how do you then communicate it? And for me, the medium is the message, right? If you see something yeah. and it's put out on TikTok, the contextual environment and the mood you're in and, you know, everything kind of plays into it. So if you see, I mean, I'm, I'll talk about it from my world, right? If I, If a luxury brand puts an advert on the back of a toilet door, that's terrible, right? Because it suddenly degrades the brand. Um, you think of it as cheap, smelly, um whatever else however a luxury brand going and doing a huge runway show in the biggest cities in the world with you know everyone getting given free goodies etc suddenly you think really positively if i apply that same logic to research and science and communication it's if you want everybody to really care about your work if the, and we think that the medium is the message and so that basically where you show up is how people are going to take it in. I think there's that's why science communication in places like the Cheltenham Science Festival or the BBC Breakfast Red Sofa in the morning or, yeah, the person on TikTok. And I think that's why do the research. But then I don't expect scientists to then also be great. I don't think they, you need to be a great marketer to be a great scientist or a great communicator, but working with people who are passionate about communications to go, hi, 
please help me turn the complex into the simple you know complete like how do we and i think that's where things like ai are actually going to be really helpful because if you can upload your phd into an advanced chat gpt and say hey give me the five key takeouts amazing incredible that's your five tiktoks gone done so and i don't think i, I say this in a very simplistic and very reductive way i don't believe it's that's the, the the whole truth of it but for the purpose of this um i think there's 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 ways to communicate and coming back to that sort of self-fulfilling prophecy the the other thing as well is that you know every industry needs diversity of thought so if you're only bringing in people that understand science into science who then care about science who that you know, you're never going to get anyone else interested who maybe didn't even think that science was for them um who who might have a completely different approach to to research or a different approach to yeah bringing in uh, you know bringing in patients recruiting patients so so yeah i i think for me do more things like I've seen Beth talk at Fame Lab. Amazing, incredible. Who doesn't want to be in a pub and listen to a story that actually has a really important message underneath it? I hope everybody was taking notes. Yes. <laughs> I... <laughs> but I think I, there's a, there's an overarching point there, isn't it? Because it's there's there's going to be loads of people who will. What's it called? Is it the Dunning Kruger effect? You find out a little yeah, bit of knowledge is. and then you end up that you think you're an expert. You're going to get, you'll have a lot of people who probably read one thing about Parkinson's because that was the one thing that got picked up. And then they'll go on TikTok and they'll wax lyrical with cool emojis and GIFs and things flying all over the screen. And then you're suddenly you've got a million people going, oh my God, if I eat broccoli, I'm going to get <laughs> Parkinson's. Um Hey, that, just to clarify, broccoli will not cause Parkinson's disease and has definitely not been proven to do so. Awful example. <laughs> Awful example and definitely not. But you see, so that's why I think it's super, that's why I think science communication and the sort of the the skill of, of science communication is incredibly important because I think when I've sat and, and watched or Beth shared with me like, oh, look at this Instagram or look at this person's TikTok and it's someone who's an expert and is great at communication. It's like, that's a unicorn that needs to be catapulted into the world. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, yeah, you get you get some really good sort of, especially YouTubers now, like doctors and stuff who explain things pretty well and are really engaging these days. So yeah, I agree with both of you that we are getting better at it and just need just need more people. Involved. I think you need to hire a, a Gen Zer to be honest. Mm. Uh, and they'll tell you how to make Parkinson's rap. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I could afford <laughs> hiring a Gen Zer. I feel I feel they'd be expensive at this point in time. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you so much, guys, for coming on. No, um, thank you so much for having us here. It's been very lovely. Thank I had you. a I had a great time. Thank you, Pollyanna. Thank you, Beth. Uh, the last thing which we ask our guests, I bet this is for you. If you had one piece of advice to give to all our listeners, what would it be? Oh, can I give two very quickly? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, um, when you are starting out, say yes to almost everything that you get offered. Um, if you think it sounds interesting or a bit scary, just just do it because you're trying to figure out what you enjoy. Um, you can say no later down the line, but just say yes. The amount of things I've put forward, the Fame Lab is a great example. Just put it last minute, put something together. I was terrified, did it. Amazing. Second of all um, is, this is maybe, so that's maybe for other kind of students kind of coming up. Second is for just everybody is, please get involved in research. Um, I know it can be scary, especially sometimes the MRI imaging, but these studies are not possible if people... Uh, don't get involved and it's so appreciated when you do and you know you are helping you know, future treatments cures and finding out more about these diseases and about any anything in the world two pieces awesome two very good pieces of advice yep. uh 
and of course we'll put the bet study or like best labs contacts up on the show notes so that if anybody cool. is interested in or in the liverpool area and wants to participate in research um in neuroimaging research then they could probably find you that way yeah yeah i'm looking for people between the ages 55 and 80 but um <laughs> i do not know I that's friends. my target demographic so please listeners um show this podcast to your grandparents parents <laughs> uh yeah uh but yeah thank you everybody for listening thank you again vet and poliana for coming on yeah until next time take care thank you thanks everyone bye